I'm Ashton Addison from the Crypto Coin Show, and today on Blockchain Interviews, we have back with us Dan Thompson, CEO of Sensei, here to talk about AI, digital replicas, uh, and everything else uh, in the artificial intelligence world. Dan, welcome back to the show. It is a pleasure to have you here. Oh, it's always great to be on this show. Thanks for having me again. Very welcome. Uh, AI is moving faster than ever. I'm hoping eventually it will do all my work for me. I'm excited to get your industry insider insights into uh, the world of AI and what you and your team are working on at Sensei. I'd love to start off our conversation with a recap uh, for those who haven't seen our previous interviews. And I know there's a lot of updates as well uh, on what exactly Sensei is focused on. And then we can dive into all things AI. Yeah, well, I mean, that kind of touches on uh, all the points that I guess we're going to talk about. But the, you know, uh, the, hopefully the next interview will be my replica coming through. Maybe <laughs> we're not that far away from that. Um, so Sensei literally creates that exactly that. We're building digital immortality and creating digital replicas that can be used uh, con in contemporary use cases for businesses, individuals, uh, as, as a tool for knowledge management within organizations as well as automations and uh, as, a, as essentially as a perfect personal assistant for yourself so imagine having a version of you that can pre-draft your emails or mm. basically you know have your entire knowledge base from your digital footprint from your previous messages from the, the documents that you work from and having something that combined with a sufficiently advanced ai replies in your or is able to reply or at least draft replies depending on your preference uh to those different to the different questions that we get asked every day you know we're online mm -hmm. for a certain hours a day and there's therefore a lot of time where we're asleep or maybe enjoying some personal time and our replicas will essentially enable us to uh, or our, our teams and people around us to not be stuck and not um, not be limited to the availability of our own time. So essentially, they they act as an extension of ourselves that can share our knowledge, experiences, skills with people globally, twenty four seven in in any language. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's it's a fascinating tool. It's, it's literally building a version of science fiction where we can build these perfect digital replicas of people that can interact on their behalf for them. Wow. No, it sounds great to be able to cut some of those hours of work and have your digital replica uh, do it. Um, but how? So, how, if somebody was interested in starting on this, working with the AI, you know, the AI has to learn information about the person and the job that they're doing to start doing it effectively. So, uh, maybe you could walk through how that would work. If I was like, "Hey, I want someone to take over Crypto Coin Show. How do I get teach this AI to learn?" about being me and the work that I'm doing. Yeah. So it's, it's always kind of backwards the way people imagine things to be more difficult or easier. The easiest things are things like your voice or your image, right? So you, it's, it's actually very quick and easy to train the image and voice. Um, there's a few great, you know, uh, projects out there and, and companies out there developing the technology for that. So you can go and quickly record very, very little of your voice, really like 30 seconds is enough and maybe two to three minutes of, of of high quality video content to train the actual sort of imagery and and voice to be similar to you obviously the the higher quality the longer the better but it's it's relatively simple the trickier wow. part is really you know searching for the information that you want it to have and filtering through your own life to understand which parts of uh, you that you want to have replicated and who we are is, is is probably the most fascinating part of what we're building and, and how we build it because the subject of identity is uh, and our own existence is um, you know been contemplated for millennia, but when it comes to actually replicating that, you know you've got a version of yourself that you think you are, you've got a version of yourself that you put out there on social media, another version of yourself maybe for work, and then you have this subjective approach to who you are that is reflected in the people around us. So you may be you know one way to your closest family, you may be a completely different person to a colleague or someone you're interviewing. You might be a completely different person to, um, you know, the, the, a random person you meet on the street just because you've had, I don't know, a bad day. Each of these interactions with these people are, you know, one version of yourself that they perceive you as. And those might be completely different to your work persona or your, your social media persona. 
So it's it's really complicated to try and take all that into account and understand the nuances and the the languages we use when presenting ourselves in certain formats on certain platforms. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's what we try and do. We try and help mm -hmm. to you know, um, capture the relevant information for the relevant use case for the replicas, so that they become useful and you know actually represent the person they're meant to be um, a copy of. Mm -hmm. Now that's really interesting because I feel like it's you're really taking it to the next level. Because when I first think of okay, I need an AI to help me with my inbox, I think okay, well, you know, I'm just typing a reply to an email. They're not listening to me. They can't see me. You know, it's I feel like it's easier to get away with it, so to say that hey, this AI can do it, and they can't really tell that the AI is responding. But when I actually add in my own voice and and video. It's really taking it to the next next level of like, hey, you can, you know, I can send voice messages or hop on a call with you, and it's not even me. It sounds like you know otherworldly. Yeah, I mean, there's there is still the uncanny valley uh, issue to solve, which is that you know people uh, get a bit creeped out by when they're the fact they're interacting with you know non-human robotics and AI, which is definitely true. And one of the things we've come to realize um, when creating this technology is that. You know, people will as much as, as much of a wow factor is the the video and the voice. As soon as people do kind of recognize that it is, uh, you know, AI doing it for on behalf of the person. Sometimes it's okay because it's kind of you know you get the information you need. But a lot of the time, people just prefer the text messages. And mm -hmm. we're also realizing that people there's an uncomfortable aspect of if someone has their replica acting for them on kind of autopilot like like i do a lot of the time not everyone's quite as uh brave to let an ai just do their do their replies for them automatically so mm -hmm. we're working in this kind of human um oversight um feature to it that will allow essentially the a bit like having your emails drafted rather than automatically sent for mm -hmm. you so that you can just check them it, it should it will save everyone a huge amount of time by having the mm -hmm you know drafted for them every morning rather than having to type them out and process them all yourself manually but it's definitely a lot more, a lot more comfortable for both the person sending and the receiver knowing that the human essentially um you know approve the message going out a bit like having a personal assistant who can send mm -hmm. mail you can do things for you and can use your email address to send things for you but you know, with your kind of approval first, it just makes it feel a bit better, which is is weird because you know people do trust PAs all the time. They, you know, it's, a, it's an entire industry in certain countries. So there's you know there is a uh, you know a, a precedent for this that people have used a lot. You know, secretaries and PAs to to do all their mail and and emails and messages and calls for, on their behalf historically. But then suddenly, as soon as it's done by a robot, which arguably is more accurate suddenly there's something weird about it and mm -hmm. um so it's kind of understanding where that practicality versus uh nuance sort of preferences come in yeah it's a great point and i feel like there will be a transition period where it feels eerie at first and then it's normal because they realize the advantages of you know it's it's like having a self-checkout machine it, it's never gonna you know give you the wrong change um and after a few years you're like of course we prefer the automated version over the pa who who could make mistakes and be subjective um, and on that email front i feel like a lot of salespeople, at least you know they're sort of typing the same thing to each client like trying to close the sale is very repetitive you know it could definitely be more efficient and i, I see huge advantages for ai there uh, on, on the sales side now i'm sure that there's many, many applications in all of the different industries, sales being a great one. Uh, what are some of the business areas that, that Sensei is looking at as obvious, low-hanging fruit, first use case applications to uh, automate with AI these different business uses? Yeah, and I just, I just want to touch on the the, the automatic um, checkout service. I mean, that's a great example of you know this kind of technology that does get there and automates things. And I remember when I first saw that, it was um, yeah, you don't really trust it so much. But now, yeah, it's so normal. You just you can't you know you almost don't want to go to a person because it's just inefficient. Mm -hmm. And someone else made a similar comparison the other day, like saying how weird it was to first see people with mobile phones and how easy and common that is now, and because of the convenience of it. And that's what we see this as as well. The convenience of having a literally mini you, the digital you that can go out and do stuff for you is, is going to be huge. 
So yeah, in terms of industries and, and app, initial applications for it, we see two two major ones. The first one is for any company that deals in knowledge management and, and actually deals in knowledge in general, right? So you're looking at um, consulting, you're looking at uh, legal firms, uh, education, healthcare, pretty much a lot of different industries that have a heavy requirement on an individual sort of knowledge and understanding of a certain topic. When that happens, obviously, there's a huge brain drain when people move around from organization to organization, when they retire, when they're just offline, they go on holiday, the maternity leave, the, they sleep. So having replicas of high performing, high quality people, enabling them to have to share that knowledge, even when they're not available, having the ability to share that knowledge far and further and uh, wider than their, their physical and mental capabilities can. So taking, I don't know, let's say uh, one of the a leading professor of the world in a particular subject in uh, MIT and enabling them to teach their subjects to anyone globally on a very intimate basis, uh, you know, into places that knowledge is completely scarce and, you know, unavailable. And the dream of even going to a college like that would be impossible suddenly it becomes very, very accessible for everyone. Yeah. You could look at, you know, high performing experts, the consulting firms and lots of other big, you know, companies, insurance companies or whoever pay to come and visit their companies to give speeches. They pay tens of thousands of dollars just for the, uh, just for the, the speaker. Having a replica of that person means that not only do they have the, the speech for the half an hour, hour, hour and a half, but they have this kind of interactive replica they could that people can directly ask questions to and actually get more out of that knowledge uh and and ask the questions they want to so replicating high performing key people uh with really high quality replicas is the sort of main one of the, the the main use case for replication technology and one of the most applicable services the 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 knowledge within most organizations is pretty scarce fleeting can disappear and usually relatively inaccessible. So replicas kind of solve a lot of that. Mm -hmm. You then can look at the second major use case, which is a very scalable, essentially message automator. Think um, autofill, but on like crazy steroids. You've got a, you know, you take a bit of your personality. It doesn't require too much background knowledge. Usually your internal communications from uh, the um, organization, some access to the documents that it should be able to reference. And then you can actually have this kind of automator that basically works as a personalized autofill that would draft out messages for you based on the previous conversations, help you writing summaries, booking things into your calendar, you know, basically all the sort of usual day-to-day -day admin that we all have to go through to get anything done. Your, you know, rep will be able to do pretty much most of, most of it, obviously with some human human oversight if, if required. Otherwise, you know, people like, like me would be very happy to have it fully automate their life and sit back and while it goes to do the interviews, you know. <laughs> no, that that it does sound like a dream. And those industries that you mentioned, that that's huge. Obviously, consulting uh, the, the healthcare industry, especially in America, you know, they're spending double the defense budget. If we can automate some of that with AI and make it more efficient um, and uh, I feel like the big four accounting firms, you know, accounting and consulting, they do both. Um, that's probably millions of millions and millions of dollars. They could actually put more in their pockets if they could lower the human capital side and, and make more automation. And, 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 and yeah. speaking of that, I'm curious on your thoughts on, you know, the, the, the good and the bad of AI. And part of it is obviously it's automating so many tasks, <clears throat> making it more efficient. And on the other side, maybe there's an argument that there's less humans that need to do work and, and then there's people out of a job or maybe jobs just shift into a new kind of paradigm where maybe they manage the AI. Do you think that this kind of technology is going to replace people altogether or just kind of shift their jobs? I think there'll definitely be a, sh a shift more than a replace. Um, you know, we see this as, as as an empowerment tool, as an extension of ourselves. Certain industries are more at risk than others from being replaced, and certain jobs will inevitably be lost and and I guess shifted into different jobs. I think the the main use case for for replicas as a whole and and AI in general are that um, you know they will enhance our lives in a lot of ways, freeing us up to do a lot of things we want to do. 
it will be difficult to start. There'll be a lot of um, much faster moving shifts in the industry and technology, which will disrupt a lot of things and uh, create a lot of inequality to begin with. But if you do believe in the good of AI and good of people, then inevitably AI does fix a lot of other problems that we have around the world as well. That essentially mm -hmm. means that work almost becomes, could be almost become irrelevant. There may become a, global basic income and living standard that we we could achieve using ai yeah there are obviously a lot of conspiracies and um and uh, a negative approach to that I, I try and stay on the positive positive side i think that there's always risks in any any kind of new technology yeah. but i think the ai will do a lot of good for us there may be obviously a lot of disruption it's a big change you know but same with any any kind of historical uh industrial revolution uh it's um you know, there's there's a lot of people who are afraid of the change. A lot of people who fight back against it, and inevitably the the change in the the convenience and the ease and the, the productivity of people who embrace the new technology inevitably mm -hmm. win out. So I think it's it's a lot like that. I think uh, you know some of the biggest concerns around AI are privacy concerns, which is fair. Uh, a lot of us sacrifice our our privacy on a day to day basis just to use the latest smartphones, smartwatches, mm -hmm. laptops. So I think that there's always, um, you know, some kind of playoff against privacy when it comes to convenience. Uh, but I don't think we should be af afraid of AI in general. I think that the, you know, um, the way it's currently set up, you know, with L LLMs as a as a sort of a, a go-to approach to AI, you know, it's still got a, quite a lot of limitations. It's not quite um, Skynet mm -hmm. just yet, mm -hmm. and it's in fact quite a, quite a long way off and so even when it comes to this idea of creating agi and, and sentience it's possible and it, and it is a pro you know in theory approaching faster and faster but personally you know do i do we think do i think it's going to have a big negative effect on us i don't think so i think the advancement of humanity as a whole will continue um plenty of opportunity and i think we're probably more of a risk to ourselves than ai ever will be hmm. <laughs> yeah that's an interesting perspective and I feel like smaller companies, startups, those in crypto that are willing to take risks or try new technology, be more innovative um, than, you know, some of these big four companies that I mentioned, you know, they have huge levels of bureaucracy and it takes time to uh, integrate something like AI that's going to automate everything. Um, I feel like they're more willing to take risks. Is Sensei developing a technology that's also focused on small startups, whether it's just, you know, the email part or something that, hey, we have a really small company, how can we automate as much of this as possible so that we don't end up like one of these big four that have 20,000 employees and our overhead is huge? How can we automate and, and sort of keep the amount of people small and keep the AI big? Well, that's it. I think that the age of those sort of big companies is kind of over. AI really does put a shift in that. And yeah, so when it comes to the way we structure, um, we pretty much have it as a SaaS model. So we have enterprise plans for larger corporations and organizations, but it can be purchased and used by the individual as well. So the packages do really range and the same accessibility, the same features are all there. The only difference is on enterprise models, they you know essentially have an internally hosted version of Sensei, uh, which uh, sits, you know, sort of... Um, blocked off away from uh, general platform and internet mm. and in the same way that they you know they use other LLMs uh, very sort of cautiously to not have access to their entire pri mm. pri private data because it, so far in, in the use of AI and uh, and most people's awareness AI has been trained mostly on public data and all that public data in it whether it's been open source whether it's been you know farmed off sites or you're just scraped from any any kind of public websites that, that have, have the scraping of capabilities you you know you end up with this huge amount of like public data that's there right on the, open and out there on the web but there's also a huge amount of corporate data and, and organizational data that is still relatively untapped so there's a huge amount of mm -hmm. private data that you know, kept on these systems internally, isn't available to the public overall, um, and not definitely not available to some of these other organizations. Now, they may have mm -hmm. made some private deals behind doors, but fundamentally, you know, a lot of this data is still still theirs and still closed off, and they're being very cautious about how they approach AI with, with good reason. So a lot of them have got emerging tech departments, AI departments, or someone specifically looking into, you know, which technologies can be applied to them that would be relevant. 
So I think there's still a lot of opportunity for a lot of smaller startups and a lot of smaller companies to be very agile here and very fast moving in a way that the bigger bigger guys can't. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there's always stories about how people are completely blown away by being shown ChatGPT or how they see, you know, a random consultant from one of the big four, for example, going to a particular pitch and just pulling out something that was very obviously, you know, produced by ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's still time. There's still lots mm -hmm. of time available. The big guys do move a bit slower and definitely integrating is going to be uh, slower, but we are making sure that we can cater for uh, organizations at all level. And I'm very careful to say organizations here because it's not just companies that can use this kind of technology to make themselves more efficient. It's any kind of organization, including governments, uh, companies, you can look at nonprofits, charities, uh, anyone really, anyone can, uh, can really benefit from having, you know, a, essentially a replica workforce. Mm. That's a great point about uh, the privacy aspect of it. And also with these big corporations, you know, if they have uh, information that sort of privileged information, people are normally paying for it. They're not going to go and, and input all of that into an open AI model that's that's public. So what you're, what from what I understand, what you're saying is with the enterprise models uh, of sensing, for example, mm -hmm. if you are building a startup and you know this is like information that you want to keep uh, away from everybody so they can't just copy your idea, you're able to sort of have a more enterprise privatized language model that you can build and train and sort of segregate so that, hey, our clients can use this, but we're not going to like let everybody train from it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, we're very aware that that is a big issue for a lot of a lot of companies. So we have this capability to essentially run run a sensei node within their existing systems mm -hmm. that has its own model completely separated from the rest of our platform. And uh, yeah, is available to larger enterprise customers that, that want something like that. And so that, you know, we, we know that's really important uh, for them. Uh, for us, it's uh, you know, just a part, it's just another element of security in our system that we, we've had to put in uh, from the early days so yeah it's um yeah we know we understand it's important for a lot of people so we just we make sure that that's always been something that we can offer mm -hmm. and you mentioned you know the, the the progression of ai is it gets exponentially better year over year i think the open ai model is getting 10 times better each year um, and we still might be away away a ways away from you know sentience uh, but it goes fast how is Sensei planning to keep up, you know, in 2025, uh, AI is going to get 10 times better, you know, what's on the roadmap or what's the goal in making this functionality 10 times better and getting it into the hands of the right corporations and having the right customers? Yeah, it's interesting. I think someone recently published that we are no longer following Moore's law. It's now uh, Moore's law squared, which is mm -hmm. actually crazy. So it means that we've accelerated wow. beyond Moore's law, which is um, amazing. And yeah, in terms of keeping up, so you know, obviously we want to provide as much utility for users now, and we're we're kind of predicting where things are going to go. But we really think that you know by working on and improving constantly to build the best quality replicas of people, what it does is it enables us to you know stay ahead by focusing on that that sort of personality engine, how we really capture understanding what it is that makes us us, you know, what which parts of us make us sound more human and less like chatbots and how that can be replicated how the different nuances of humanity how the different characteristics how the different you know emotions of us can be uh, presented in 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 digital format and by doing that i think that it's it's not the easiest thing to think about it's definitely not the easiest thing to build so by focusing on how that we uh, you know how we build those out and we become the experts in that a specific field these replicas will just start to get more and more utility these different agents that are being built out in the space and the different utilities that can be applied to the sensor replicas uh, will just be added on bit by bit and they just become more and more useful in the same way you know mobile phones went from being just kind of like oh you're yeah, an extension of uh, of yourself as a, as a quick way to phone people through all the way through to smartphones and continue to develop and and add features on they went Mm -hmm. No, it's a, it's a really exciting time and I'm definitely going to get an AI to take over my email as soon as I can because uh, it's just one less thing that I have to focus on and I can focus on the high level business You know, with these startups. Um, there, there's a lot to do with, with less people and, and automation is good 
uh, for, for small companies in crypto uh, and outside of crypto as well. Um, so what is the best way for uh, entrepreneurs or, or small startups or the big four to start looking into this technology and also to follow along with the updates as Sensei gets better with the AI training and, and everything else your team is releasing? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, by all means, check out our website at sensei.io. That's S E N S A Y. Um, check us out on social, any social media, any channels. So, at Ask Sensei. But get in touch. I mean, reaching out to us, whether it's from a larger company or a small or medium um, startup or, or just company in general, by getting in touch, we are taking on a few uh, design partners right now for larger, especially for larger enterprises that we can actually build out solutions that they are looking for specifically. And we're always happy f uh, at this early stage to be you know, agile and have the ability to solve some of the simpler problems. We've got quite an ambitious roadmap over the next two years. Uh, both in terms of sales and onboarding uh, quite a substantial number of, of customers, but also in terms of the features, the inputs, and the sort of external channels that we're working with. So even now you can create your replicas, you can have them on your on your own website as a widget, on Telegram, on Discord, um, very soon things like WhatsApp and Slack and, and a few others. And then obviously the email drafter is, is coming out at the end of this month. So there's you know a lot of different opportunities for uh, applicate, app, applying the technology already. But we're always happy to speak to anyone who has a specific, you know, use case or niche that they would like to address, and we can see what we can do. So it's uh, it's still a very very fun time where we're really enjoying, um, you know, solving a lot of really interesting problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the best for your team on on solving those. I'm really hoping that it, it gets done because it's only going to help everybody be more efficient in business. Um, and I can also leave a link in the show notes to those socials and the platform. Um, I, I'm looking forward to that, that email drafter you mentioned there. I'm definitely going to check that out. And, um, and I'll, I would love to follow along. And I appreciate your insights on AI uh, as a whole in, in the industry and the growth. It's so hard to keep up. Uh, I, I need you to come back on the show more often. So I would, I would love to have you guys back on um, in, you know, in the next quarter. Um, if, if not too much has happened since then, uh, if not sooner. Thanks so much for taking the time, Dan. No worries. Well, the next time it will be uh, your replica interviewing mine. <laughs> Love it. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks.